can we start with your with your uh your your uh sorting algorithm sure. paper sure you know you keep doing the most amazing things why don't you talk about it for a while then kate's maybe you i think it ties into a bunch of stuff that i've done too michael that i hadn't put together cool so that yeah. if that just is a possible agenda then uh, uh, other possible things to consider or not from uh, my end and not yet Kate's is I uh, I think I resent you the paper on a third transition in science. Yep. And the other thing is I've gotten to this very weird stuff that the Neumann's universal constructor self-reproducing system is I think fundamentally wrong about life. It's very strange, hmm. but that's an awful lot to talk about. So why don't you take the lead? Sure, sure. Now that sounds great, and I'd love to. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. Um, well, to, uh, the the thing, and and of course, I had seen your paper before, and I'd I'd also um, seen uh, the paper that you sent me, and um, uh, there's a lot in common here. The the there's there's a there's a fu fundamental two two fundamental things that uh, that are uh, important that I try to address with that algorithms paper. One is uh, I'm interested in extremely basal cognition. In other words. I want to understand what are the simplest uh, possible systems where already uh, features start to creep in that are basically making the system amenable to the tools of behavioral cognitive sciences and, and so on, right? Like where, where does it come in? And the thing with biology, I mean, we can do, and which we do in the lab, we work on simple biologicals, but in biology, there's always more mechanism to be discovered. So it's always possible that somebody says, well, you just stay wait long enough, you'll find a mechanism for it. It's in there. Evolution baked it in there somewhere. And so, so I, I was looking for um, a, a, an extremely uh, simplified minimal model, which is uh, transparent, deterministic, uh, and, and these, these sorting algorithms are that, that people have been studying them for many decades. Every computer science student uh, plays with them. We think we know what they do. There's only six lines of code or so. They're transparent. They're deterministic. There is nowhere to hide. There, are, there is no more explicit mechanism, right? It, like the algorithm is what it is. That's it. There's no, there's no, there's no, um, uh, there's no more uh, baked in features to, to, to be found. Um, and uh, and so so the basal cognition is one, one angle, and the other thing I'm really interested in, which ties into what some of your your two papers were about, has to do with uh, the emergence of first of all the emergence of novel agents, and then the emergence of uh, the goals of these novel agents, because typically when we look at a standard biological system and we say why does it have this structure, why does it have this behavior, the answer usually is well eons of selection. Right. It's been it's been selected to do specific things. And so my question is, OK, but but systems that have never been here before, where do their goals come from? Right. And, and the, the, the emergence, not just the emergence of complexity, which is easy, as, as you well know, complexity is easy to emerge from simple rules, but the emergence of, uh, of basal um, intelligence. So goal directedness, um, some competency in William James's uh, definition of intelligence to reach the same goal by different means. So where do those come from? Where do the goals of novel composite systems come from? And so and so that's what I'm what I'm very interested in. And and so and so these um, and we face this in the lab with with Xenobots and now with Anthrobots and and so on. And with these algorithms, we just try to make it as simple as possible. Look, you have you have this the, these these standard algorithms, and we only made two changes. Otherwise, they're exactly as they always have been. The first change is that. They are now distributed bottom up, meaning that every cell having a certain number has a, has a, is following an algorithm based on what the neighbors are about what it's going to do. There is no omniscient top down, you know, sort of uh, universal controller that's uh, that's running all of it. So each one has its own local preferences and its own local view of, of the world. And uh, and we also um, break the uh, the <laughs> assumption, uh, break the assumption of a uh, of a reliable medium. In other words, typically with these algorithms, when the algorithm says swap two numbers, you they swap and you assume that they swap and that's it. In our case, we say, well, sometimes the cells are broken and sometimes they either don't initiate swaps or they refuse to be swapped or whatever. That's it. We we don't uh, give we don't add any code to the algorithm to to test for whether in fact an operation mm -hmm. succeeded. We don't give them any way of knowing how well is the sorting going overall. They don't have any of that. It's the traditional uh, traditional algorithm. And uh, and the most important, so so I think there are two most important things in that paper. 
And the first one is on the basal cognition end, which is this one version of competency of navigating some kind of problem space is what I call delayed gratification. And there's this idea that when you come upon a barrier in your space, in order to sometimes in order to go around that barrier, you have to temporarily be doing worse. And, and William James's definite um, example is, is magnets, uh, two magnets uh, separated by a piece of wood. So the magnets are not able to go around the piece of wood because in order to do that, they would temporarily have to get further from each other. And they're not smart enough to do that. They're, they're always going to be minimizing that distance. So all they're ever going to do is sit there pressed with their, you know, pressed up against the wood where, and then, and then he says, well, now look at Romeo and Juliet. They've got physical barriers. They've got uh, social barriers there, but, but they have more skills. They have a planning and memory and all these other things. So they can temporarily get further from each other other to then you know get closer afterwards so um and so and so your ability to do that your ability to temporarily make things worse in order to later um, achieve certain gains so 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 i call it delayed gratification so so we we simply asked if you do introduce barriers in these algorithms journey towards uh, being sorted meaning the what when i say barrier i mean a cell that is broken and it's just not going to move you need to you need to move it but it isn't going to move um, what we found is that when they come upon these barriers, they actually backtrack. The sorting of the whole string gets worse temporarily. And then eventually they sort of rearrange a bunch of other stuff and they eventually are able to do better. Now, this is completely emergent. This isn't baked into, the, there's nothing in the algorithm about any of this. The algorithm doesn't uh, ask whether the, cell, whether the cells moved. It doesn't ask how you're doing. It doesn't say anything about being able to backtrack. It's the same old traditional algorithm that everybody's been playing with. And it turns out that it has this uh, unexpected uh, capacity to uh, for delayed gratification in its problem space. So that's so that's one big thing that we found. And then the other thing that we found is because we because we give the algorithms to each cell as opposed to having one you know centralized one, we get to do the kind of experiments we do in biology, which is to make a chimera. So in our lab, we make frogolotls. So frogolotls are some cells from a frog embryo, some cells from a from a xenopus embryo, from a from a, uh, from an axolotl, and each of them have different uh, hardware. They have different genetics. You smush them together, and you find out that they actually get along perfectly well, and they make a they make a new organism. And you could ask that question, like baby um, axolotls have legs, tadpoles don't have legs. If I combine frog and axolotl cells, is a frogolotl going to have legs or not? We have no, you know, we have all the genetics. You have the, the genome of the frog. You have the genome of the axolotl. You still can't say whether they're going to have legs or not because you, because right. You, you can't um, directly read the, uh, the, the, the collective decision-making in anatomical space from the protein level hardware, which is what you get from reading the genomes. So, uh, so we made these chimeric uh, strings and we found out that, yeah, they still sort perfectly well, even if they're made up of different algorithms. But the amazing thing is that if you ask during that whole process of sorting, what does the distribution of the two algorithms, and, and um, Adam Goldstein calls them algotypes, I think it's a good word. Um, <laughs> what's the distribution of these algotypes within any given string? You find something really crazy. At the beginning, um, so, so let's define this notion of clustering. Clustering just means I look, I look next to me and I ask, what's the probability that the cell next to me is the same algotype as I am? Keeping in mind that these algorithms do not have any notion of algotype in them. They don't, they don't store what algorithm they are. They don't know how to check their neighbors. There's none of this is explicit. The algorithm doesn't do any of that. This is all completely um, emergent somehow. And so what it turns out is that, okay, at the beginning uh, of the whole process, it's, uh, the clustering is 50%. It's at its lowest point. And, we, and it has to be that way because we assign the algotypes randomly to the, to the, to the numbers in the string. Fine. At the end, it's also 50% because by the time you've sorted them according to number, uh, the assignment is random, just like it was at the beginning. So it's 50% at the beginning, it's 50% at the end. But in the middle, it goes like this. And in the middle, it's quite a bit higher than that because during that whole process, uh, uh, cells with the same algotype try to hang out together and they spend as much time as they can together. And we, we know, um, and, and then what happens is, and this is like, um, this is kind of crazy to say, but it's it's almost uh, it's almost a, a minimal model of 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 the human condition where 
you know, you get a certain amount of time to do interesting things, but the laws of the, of, of the world eventually, you know, the laws of your universe eventually like, <laughs> right. Like, like, like yank you, you know, yank you from, from where you were trying to be because the sorting algorithm can't be um, denied for too long. It's going to sort the numbers eventually. Right. And so, but in the middle, they get to, they get to hang out together. And, um, we also, we also did this thing. I said, well, let's just see, uh, how much what what how how much effort like, how how much do they really want to cluster and the way to test it is to allow numbers to repeat so if i allow you to have multiple of every number then as long as all your fives are in the correct location you can cluster you know half of the fives are one algorithm half of the fives are the other and you don't get pulled apart you can keep that and so if you do that if you allow them to have multiple then then the clustering goes even higher because it obviously wants to cluster more. It's just that the, the eventually the sorting algorithm um, takes you know can't be can't be resisted anymore. So so there's this crazy there's this crazy innate um, tendency for them to cluster. Uh, I I don't know what causes it, but I have a I have a hypothesis about it that that we're not sure yet. I I think it has to do with surprise minimization. I think it's a kind of Firstonian thing where. You, you cluster with with your own algo type because because they're they're the least surprising they're, they're the most like you basically um yeah uh, anyway uh yeah so so th so that's the thing and 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 this is just it's an it's an extremely minimal model and it's got this nice feature which i think a lot of um uh, systems in this field have which is you can take the sort of mechanistic reductionistic tack and you can sort of follow all the steps and you're never going to see a miracle. It, 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 the computer works correctly. The algorithm works correctly. If you, if you insist on the, on the, uh, the kind of micro scale uh, walkthrough, yeah, everything makes sense. But if you pull back and look at it from a, from a larger scale, you see, oh, there's something going on here that uh, it, it isn't because the laws are violated. It isn't because, you know, at the micro scale, these, the, you know, there's any, there's any magic. It's because there's a larger scale pattern that's completely not obvious from the explicit algorithm that we put in. And if that dumb six line algorithm has these emerging uh, uh, capacities for novel, um, novel problem solving behaviors and, and you know, novel, novel patterns that they try to maintain, then of course, uh, the more complex ones, both in computer science and in biology, will have them you know, through the roof, things that we can't even you know, begin to expect. So that's my, that's my story of the, of the algorithms. It's really neat. Listen, uh, let me just throw in one thing if Kate, you want to go next. But uh, Michael, um, uh, it's your xenobots are fascinating. And so is your axolotl frog chimeras. We, we can't possibly have time to talk about all of that today. Um, but I'd certainly love to talk about it. And Kate might also. Sure, some sure, other time sure. more so Katie, do you want to say some things or, or why do you want to do it? Um, well, if you don't mind, um, I, I uh, <laughs> first I want to thank you for what you're doing because it's, uh, oh my God, I've been walking backwards from psychology uh, for, well, 30-ish years, uh, mm. wanting to understand what the valence of emotion mm. really is and what mm. it comes from. Mm. And um, when I found Stu's book, The Origins of Order, uh, that was the first time I'd been exposed, you know, having a background in clinical psychology to the whole bottom up emergent self organization story. So yeah. I was absolutely thrilled by that. And um, me too. Me too I, I'm, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it was so evocative. I, people saw things in there that Stu didn't really yeah. intend, but that's just how his genius is. So, um, I, I, I experienced your work as the next level of that because I've been talking about emotion as a sensory system for a very mm. long time. And in the paper that I wrote, which <laughs> was the culmination of working alone for like 20 years. And so there's a lot of stuff crammed together in there. That's what I did you know, when I was in the Harvard community. I wish I'd known about you right up the street at Tufts. Um, but that the, the chemical level, um, I was pointing to uh, ideas about self-regulation, the immune system, genetic regulation, epigenetic, all that stuff being balled up in this deep, deep um, sensory or function of self-regulation. And I had, you know, Candace Pert's molecules of emotion there. Mm -hmm. And then I couldn't get any lower than that, other than the concepts of feedback, mm -hmm. a couple of positive mm -hmm. and negative feedback. And now Michael Levin comes along and I can see exactly where 
um, using membrane potential is and changes in membrane potential, it, well, either going to polarized or unpolarized, and then ultimately being more negative and more positive, that's a, a very clear one-to-one -one relationship of what I've been saying about the value system. And that's where my interest is, is in psychology, you know, we follow um, physics, I mean, we're reductionists and we're still stuck with Cartesian dualism and all of that stuff. And sadly, even the best psychological stuff is based on this idea that there are dual processes in the brain, right? You've got the bottom up, quick and dirty, um, and it is fouled somehow. It, there's something wrong with that and that you really need the long going through the, you know, that too. That's wrong. There's a really, really deep evaluative system that comes up from these deeper things that, that that's the value system. And nature is now, I mean, science is supposed to say anything about values at all. And and I, I think your work is really um, it, it, the perfect example of how everything is perfectly objective and observable, and yet kind of stays away from the subjective um, perspective, which is taboo. Of course, in psychology, that's what it's all about. It's about identity. It's about personality. It's about free will. Um, I'm seeing implications um, in what you're doing for the concept of free will. That um, that there's clearly something going on there with the capacity to de make decisions at all, um, and the fact that all of this is emergent is amazing. The one thing I want to say about um, Friston, and you mentioned Mark Solms and Friston as as where you're heading in this direction, and I, I I'm absolutely right there with what they're saying. But the one thing I want to pitch at you today is. It um, surprise reduction is only monopolar. Mm. Surprise reducing it means that whatever memory system, whatever and whatever memory, it, 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 there's there's an internality here. Whatever, however, it works out in the algorithm, if it matches the external challenges, the environment, the all of those. That's what that's about, and that's definitely part of what I'm talking about. But the signaling system itself that organisms use is bipolar mm. and that when you're getting that positive feedback signal it's got a valence to it that when membrane potential is depolarizing it's 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 going up if you will and if it's depolarizing it's going down if you will and that the the depolarization then when you get back to positive and negative charge negative charge is associated with healing and regeneration right have i got that right and positive charge is associated with um damage and, and degeneration. So I'm finding a, an exact link between what I'm talking about is the source of values and why we experience um, feelings in pleasurable or painful categories. You do have to go to subjectivity, but that's, I think, a key part of what basal intelligence is about, because without that valence, you don't really have um, a decision-making, What like, okay, what am I? What state am I? What what stage is my neighbor? You have to, and then it gets down to the idea of a self versus a not self comparison between yourself and the environment. So all of that stuff, I tried to wrap into that paper, yeah. but that, um, to have, <laughs> to have what you're saying, and please correct me if I'm bastardizing your work in any way, but that it, that the implications for, for values and ethics and all of that entire realm of social systems are right buried right here in what you're doing as far as i see yeah yeah no i think i think uh, you're you're absolutely right in the sense that um if if when you when you have simple emergence like you get in fractals or you get in cellular automata uh it it it's it's free of valence because okay complex things happen you know a glider goes this way glider goes that way it's it's all sort of equivalent but as soon as you get emergence of these um, homeostatic or homeodynamic systems, which expend effort to try to keep specific states, that's it. Now you're in the land of valence and values and everything else, like my, yep. you know, micro level, because, mm -hmm. because not all states are equally preferable. They will actively try to uh, uh, reach a specific, and, and sometimes they're quite, uh, quite, you know, they have all kinds of competencies in doing that. Um, yep. So, so already you start to see, and and then and then the question becomes, well, so so where did where, where did those specific preferred states come from? Why is it that this this is the one they like instead of, you know, instead of instead of that one? And and I I really think that's one of the grand mysteries next that we need to deal with. 
you know, not just emergence of complexity, but but specifically emergence of goal directed intelligence and develop some kind of science to try to guess these goals because we make things all the time. You, you know, the fight for swarm robotics and Internet of Things and financial institutions and social institutions, and we have um, and and biological chimeras and so on. We have very little ability to guess what the goals of the system are going to be and what the competencies of that system are going to be to implement those goals in the face of uh, resistance. And uh, we need to develop a science of that, I think. So can I take a turn, you guys? Sure. Please. Um, okay, so a whole bunch of things. Um, I want to focus on your bottom up and you're allowing things to crap out and die. Okay, but before that, Michael, um, and thanks, Kate. Um, so just briefly, uh, and it's in our third transition in science paper, um, I think things focus on living cells and living cells, uh, the goal of a living cell is to get to continue to exist by its progeny. That's what gets selected. And the goals that emerge aren't set from the outside like we do when we're programming it. It's it's. You know, it's what useful to it. That's why your chimeras and your uh, xenobots seem so fascinating to me. But now put that aside. Michael, I, I realized when I read your paper and thinking about it, I think that for some years I've been doing things that are cousins of what you've done, and there may be something really general going on. So let me try to tell you. it When you take your... your uh, algorithm and you make each each uh, number an agent so it's now bottom up there's no outside control of the total system uh so they're now in a sense co-evolving with one another trying to do whatever they're trying to do years ago i found myself doing something similar and then similar in another way uh, you know that i made this nk fitness landscape model Sure. Yeah, of course. So it's this rugged landscape. So this is in uh, 1995 uh, at home in the universe. Yep. So we, we, I just, we just made a big square lattice, you know, n by n, where there's n squared points, and each point is a little site is a, and it's just the NK model, and you can think of that thing as one big patch, which is one thing, and you implement you implement a cousin of your letting things die. It's, it's just a finite temperature. So the system goes downhill in energy, uh, but every now and then it fucks it up and it goes uphill in energy. Mm -hmm. So it's a Monte Carlo. And we ran this and we asked, all right, uh, how long you go downhill until you get to some minimum, then because the errors are made, you kind of wander around. And you can ask, ask you know, how low energy do you get to? Then we took this big patch that's n by n, and we broke it up into four quadrants, four patches. And the rule now becomes your, the move you made. Each patch, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast, makes moves that are good for it. But when it does so, it screws up things for the, the patches on its boundaries. So the patches are now co-evolving with one another. So it's becoming separate agents. Mm -hmm. Then we made the patches smaller and smaller in <clears throat> size and more and more numerous. And we asked, well, what happens to the energy you get to? The remarkable thing is just what you found. The system, as the patches get smaller and more numerous, the total system does better and better and better and better and gets the ever lower energy. So breaking the thing up do a bunch of co-evolving things, uh, does something really good, then it turns out something amazing happens. There's a phase transition. When the patches get too small, uh, the thing becomes chaotic and it screws it all up. Huh. So the optimal behavior is found right at that boundary. So hold that. So what's going on in this case is uh, it's like yours. There's something about breaking things up so that it's bottom up that allows better behavior to emerge. It's like yours and the fact that given the Monte Carlo simulation and finite temperature, the, the, the things find alternative ways of getting to wherever they're going. And this led to something just amazing. Uh, about 12 years ago, I was at the university. So this is 
may be really important and really general, and we're both getting at it, and Kate, come in too, because emotions are all over it. So I was at the University of Vermont, and we were asking, I was talking, I'm a doc, and I was talking to a friend who was a doctor, and we were thinking about fitness landscapes, and you know, there's there's uh, randomized clinical trials, which are the be all and end all, and they're just big t-tests. So he asked, in the NK model, you can tune the structure of the landscape. So we asked if you have a single peak landscape like Fujiyama, or you have a rugged landscape, does randomized clinical trials work well? That was where we started. And, and it works well on a single peak landscape, just screws up all over the place on a multi-peak landscape. Well, I expected that. But Jeffrey Horbar, my colleague, had a really neat idea that's related to what you just did uh, with with the 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 uh, your algorithm, the bottom up. He said there are quality improvement centers uh, emerging in medicine, where if you have a hundred hospitals, they break up into 10, 10 groups of ten hospitals. Each one is a quality improvement center, and within the quality improvement center in real life, uh, the, the 10 hospitals in the quality improvement center are trying to do something neat, like they want to find a good combination of procedures. Mm -hmm. And you can do the procedure or not. And here's, the th so the deal is, they try a given procedure within one of these centers. And if on anecdotal evidence, not statistically significant, it looks like a good idea. They say, okay, let's do it. And then if it doesn't look good later on, they just take it back. So we implemented on a computer, Michael. Now the anecdotal evidence is incomplete information. It's noisy information. It's not quite knowing what you're doing. It's messing around. And what we found on a computer is, a computer model of it, is uh, we, made, we did it on a computer and it radically outperforms randomized clinical trials. We think therefore, the large message of your bottom up is uh, if you can connect a large number of people to try to solve a hard problem and you break them up into little patches where different groups try things and based on anecdotal evidence say, that looks like a good idea, let's try it. And if not, you say you take it back. They'll solve really hard combinatorial optimization problems that you'll never do if it's all one big system. Fascinating. And, and that's what you're finding too. There's something really general going on. And to finish up this book, uh, I'm involved in, in trying to get going on global soil restoration. And the idea is to try to create a global creative commons computational network for hopefully millions of farmers where people can upload data, share it, own it, share it with who they want, and try to solve all hard problems. Hmm. And the same thing would work in clinical medicine. So there's something about this bottom-up noisy, sloppy, trying things on anecdotal evidence that actually works. And the final thing to say about this is if we're 30,000 years ago and you had a toothache and you were in the south of France, you'd go to the medicine woman. He, she, she would say, Michael, you need the following six herbs. And they basically would work. Noted in a randomized clinical trial. How do we learn that? I think we, and I think evolution, is something like that too. And now I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Uh, you know, the, the, the clinical trial thing I've always, I've always wondered, um, uh, you know, acupuncture, which, which I've benefited from many times. I was like, how, how long would it take actually to, you know, and how many patients would you need from, if you were starting from scratch and you needed to know, you know, where the points were for specific disease, I can't imagine the size of Right, the data set you would need. It just seems. It, it just and seems nobody crazy. did a randomized clinical trial in developing yeah. acupuncture. Yeah. No yeah. Presumably not. Randomized clinical trials, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, we learned T tests, so we thought we were being scientific. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a funny uh, well there's there's two there's two things one is uh, experimentally and this was we we put out the this this reprint a while back and uh, the real the real paper should be out soon looking at. Um, groups of embryos responding to teratogens 
And it turns out that embryos are actually communicating with each other. And there's a whole, uh, what, what I think is going to be a kind of um, um, a hyper developmental biology, where instead of looking at how a single embryo develops, what you're looking at, it, how, how so, so in standard developmental biology, individual cells work together to build a nice embryo. But in fact, a, a groups of embryos are also working together and we can now track, we can see them communicating with each other. So we have, we have techniques to watch the information go back and forth. And um, uh, they literally, large groups uh, do, do better than singletons or small groups in resisting certain uh, teratogenic influences. And they have gene, the group, what larger groups has gene expression uh, that small groups don't have. So, so that, that, that sort of meta embryo has its own transcriptome that's distinct from, from the transcriptome of any of its, of any of its members and they can solve problems. Specific. Now, I don't know, as you, as in your example, you know, one possibility is that if you had even bigger groups, then they wouldn't do as well. Right. There may be like a critical, you know, critical range. We don't, we don't know. All we know is that um, the size groups that we work on, which is about, you know, 300 embryos or so do way better than, uh, than, than smaller groups. It's just amazing. So there are cousins, um, I'm doing, uh, uh, sorry, so I'm working with a guy named Jan Dijksterhaus in Holland and his colleagues. We're doing the 140 species experiment. Uh, it's underway. Uh, 70 DNA sequenced bacteria, 70 genotyped fungi. It's hard to sequence the whole thing. And we're, and we're mixing, we're, we're in the process of, we have a couple hundred, 250,000 euros, make this mixed community. And played out aliquots of it uh, on sterilized soil in 50 aliquots and watch it for a year or two. Well, they're going to do all kinds of things with one another. This is, this is, so these guys are going to learn with one another too. They're going to solve problems in all kinds yeah. of weird ways. Yeah. What, what, what is the transcriptomic, what are the gene activity patterns? Will it be identical of the different 50 aliquots? Almost certainly not. One of the fascinating things is from the the third transition in science paper, Michael, if Gates heard me talk about this, we cannot predict what, well, these things in, in Jan's phrase, an evolving community creates bubbles of new possible ways to exist together. Mm. And we can't predict what they'll be, but we can see the ones that were useful that were seized by heritable variation and natural selection. So we can ask, do the same mutations occur in the 50 aliquots and in the same sequences? Well, of course they won't. Well, these, this is a co-evolutionary assembly, and one can begin to look at the genetics of it. And it feels like, without having, I'm just hearing you, what's going on with 300 embryos talking to one another? What's going on in a tissue? These things are talking to one another. Exactly, yeah. You know, and the same things around in... Um, in the evolution of an integrated economy. If you took random bits of technologies from around the world and stuck them into place, they wouldn't work together. They work together because they came into existence together. And you're looking at all kinds of Darwinian pre-adaptations and your xenobots and stuff, which is so amazing. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that we've been we've been studying, and some of this is out and some of this hasn't, hasn't come out yet, is, uh, how how evolution works when your material is agential so if you have oh. a right if you have a hardwired material that just sort of does what it does then we know what evolution does it yeah you know it's it, it searches through these rugged spaces and all that but when your material is itself uh an agential material where the it's got a multi-scale uh nature to it where where every every scale has its own agendas and it's solving various problems then the whole process of evolution is different uh and all kinds of uh, all kinds of things don't look at all classical when and the, the so so you can keep the random mutation the intelligence isn't in 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 the mutations but but when the material is smart the, the whole process comes out completely different and that's yeah. you know that's uh we've we've got some some cool computational studies coming out on that there's so much to talk about can okay. i um, go ahead yeah please I, do, um, <laughs> uh, yeah there's so much to talk about but, um uh, Stu and i talk about kantian holes right mm -hmm. you're familiar with that concept where um you have a, a 
well, an organizational closure where you have in Stu's, uh, you have the bottom up. Is it so? I'm. It, I want to say that there's both both top down and bottom up pieces here that we need to consider. And the you know, introducing Stu's idea of the Condi and whole because that that's how we've talked about it before. So the idea is that there's parts um, that are doing something uh, that gives rise to a global whole, which then provides the constraints on on those parts to do what they were doing um, and whatever else you know so there's the so there's freedom from the bottom up and there's constraint from the top down which kind of gets at the coupling of positive and negative feedback that i was talking about you know the homo homeodynamic uh, functions of, of emotion but that the idea of work is something that needs to go in here because intelligent doing is work. And when he talks about bottom up work and top down constraints as part of constraint closure, um, the idea that, uh, well, energy release within a few degrees of freedom is how you define work, right, Stu? But yeah. that when you put agency in there, then the idea of work uh, becomes a self regulatory thing where the parts are doing something and then the whole is doing something too so you have this dance of parts and holes mm -hmm. that it, that i i think is necessary for not only constraint closure operational closure organizational closure that's talked about in different ways but informational closure mm -hmm. and, and what you're talking about certainly in um the role of bioelectricity being a kind of the glue that works at every different level so with that idea in mind um I watched some really beautiful stuff by a friend of yours, um, uh, Richard Watson. Oh, yeah. yeah his whole yeah. business on resonance and yeah, song right. and um, induction. Amazing, amazing, right? Well, not only is it amazing, but it's he's getting at exactly what my um, emotion thing, because there's there's kind of a phase lock loop going on with uh, the three <clears throat> steps. Um, compare signal cybernetic loop that I've described yep. Be because it's it, there uh, actually I met a guy in music that was he he said have you ever heard of a phase lock loop that's what we use in in music to tip positive feedback and we use it for this and we use it for that mm -hmm. and when I see what you're doing with the electro the bioelectric layer and the signaling is basically that same three-step process with the positive feedback signal being either the increase or decrease in membrane potential, right? And, or positive and negative charge. So that that would be um, a, a, a manifestation of how phase locking occurs between, well, well, when you think about um, an electromagnetic field, it's really the same thing as a whole bunch of individual oscillators, right? I read that somewhere. <laughs> but that the idea of syncing them together where the connectivity is the sync, the individuals are able to do something simple that matches what their nearest neighbors are doing. So in that same signal, if you have like, um, well, I have an edge of chaos story here that's probably very much like the least energy story as well, in that the, the resting state is the edge of chaos, the home state that one goes back to. But when, since we're non-equilibrium systems, we need to be off the edge of chaos on a regular basis. And we're either, either going to um, conserve our energy to preserve our form, or we're going to exploit that that energy, that entropy to do something creative and do some growth. And that's the, the dance of self-preservation and self-development um, um, uh, that I talk about as this really, really, really deep thing that's going on in networks. Those two things are being balanced all the time, like, you know, the, like the Tao. So um, with, with all that said, the idea of a Kantian whole and the idea of information closure means that like the simple rule for the part would be to get back to the edge of chaos, but when, when off to exploit, um, to do try new things out, like when um, um, in, a, in a situation where the stressed environment of a bacterium, the, their genetics becomes really loose, like they're trying new things out. And, and if whatever sticks gives a new level of, of, of global organization, which then feeds back down as, as you know, that, that Kantian whole. But what I'm suggesting is your, your friend with the, the, the story of songs is exactly that, because at the parts, 
you know, you're 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 exploiting the chaos to either preserve what you're doing and and duplicate what you're doing, or you're going to you try something new. And all of that stuff, there's flexibility just in our genetic system for all of that kind of stuff. You've got redundancy, you've got um, all kinds of uh, novelty, but that it's the whole that feeds back down. So staying on the edge of chaos is something that is a simple rule for the part to get back to, but that in order to maintain that connection with the whole, there's a harmonic resonance thing going on at the same time. And that's where you get into stuff like pink noise and um, the, which is a classic um, uh, marker for criticality, which is this whole edge of chaos kind of kind of thing. So all of that stuff is wrapped into my questions to you about this beautiful layer of uh, bioelectricity and how the binary um, opposites that are interacting give rise to um, the the value system in valence. And I think that there's a pretty clear story there. And if I can articulate it, I'll share it. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, it, no, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah, I mean, we, we so so we track this this business um, of uh, the parts and the whole from the very beginning of embryogenesis because initially, let's say let's say you're looking at a blastoderm of a of a a mammal or a bird or something, and it's you know fifty thousand cells, and we all look at it and we say, oh, there's an embryo. But what are you counting when you say there's one embryo? What is there one of? There are fifty thousand cells. What what is there one of? <laughs> what there's one of is is actually a kind of uh, alignment like li literally it will physical alignment of the cells in terms of planar polarity but also uh morphological alignment in that all of them are going to work towards the same journey in the anatomical space they're going to make this particular structure well what you can do is um and this is something i used to do as a grad student in uh, duck uh, duck eggs you you can take a little needle and you can and you can scratch the black put some scratches in that blastoderm and for the next four to six hours, each of those islands that you've created doesn't feel the presence of the others. And they decide that they are alone and they're going to make an embryo and they align to be an embryo and each one of them does it. And then when they heal up, well, you've got conjoined twins and triplets. And, and so, so the question of how many individuals are in an embryo is not set by the genetics. It's not known from the beginning. It could be anywhere from zero to probably, you know, with a half a dozen or more. And it's a it's a it's a um, autopoetic process that, that you know they kind of put themselves together and they have to each one has to decide where because every cell is some other cell's neighbor so they have to decide where do I end and the outside world begins, and when they do heal up this is the reason why in human conjoined twins one of the twins often has laterality defects and that's because the cells that are in between on the border they have a hard time deciding, am I the left side of this one or am I the right side of that one? And sometimes they make a mistake and, uh, and, and you can get organs that, 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 you know, that go the wrong way. Um, and so during that process, bioelectricity, but also other modalities are used by the cells to uh, synchronize into a coherent whole that's going to take a particular, uh, a particular path in anatomical space and physiological space. And, uh, and, 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 and it has a self model that tries to demarcate it from, from the outside world and everything it does is in the service of, of maintaining the goals that that new system is going to have. And for traditional systems, we kind of say, well, evolution sort of gave us gave it those goals and then and, and we call it a day. But, but, but that of course doesn't, doesn't do the trick because now we can make completely new ones that, that have never existed before. And, and, and they have, they have goal states too, that they exert lots of effort to try to maintain and they have all kinds of competencies to try and maintain it. Um, yeah. And I think, I think, you know, this business with the, with the, with the for first the Xenobots, but now the Anthrobots, yeah, so the human derived ones uh, is just the, is just the beginning of, of having these, these novel um, systems with a perfectly wild type uh, genome, you know, homo sapiens in the one case of Xenopus labus and the other uh, that have different competencies and different, uh, different uh, behavioral repertoires. And, um, and we're just beginning. So, so, you know, we, we don't know what the, what their learning capacity is, what their actual behavioral goals are. We're going to find out all of that. We're trying to train them and, you know, so, test what their preferences are. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. But, but none of it is, is, is easily predictable at, at all. For, like nobody, yeah. nobody saw any of that coming. So, Have you ever tried uh, human skin cells? The, well, the are made with lung cells, right? Yeah, the, the reason... Epithelia, the, epithelia. 
epithelio. In yeah, some yeah. I'm sure you can do it with 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 lots of different cell types. The reason we went with lung is because it, because being ciliated, they move physically, and it's easy right. when when people see physical movement, they they it's easy for them to understand. I actually think that a lot of important behaviors take place in other spaces like transcriptional space and physiological state space and anatomical morphous space. It's just, people are not comfortable recognizing that as behavior. And I suspect that a lot of the, um, what people call organoids that they're making now are basically, they basically have locked in syndrome. Like they're, 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 they're in there and they're trying to do all kinds of things. We can't see it because they're not running around. And, and that's all we're, we're sort of tuned to is, is movement in three-dimensional space. I think if we, if we understood how to uh, uh, measure the states of these things properly, we would see that they're solving all kinds of problems in other spaces. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, why I asked about the epithelial cells, because um, that's how we directly um, encounter our environment. Yeah. And we move about in our environment. So there is a bioelectric effect. I mean, the, 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 I love what you're doing because it, there's, you know, in alternative healing modalities, including acupuncture, which you measured, there's always this idea of, of subtle energy. Mm. And um, some of the new age ideas have gone crazy with it. And that I, 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 I'm looking for really natural spirituality and where our values come from um and uh, divorced from the dogma of religion but that um they they do have their thumb on the pulse of of something that's really true and real about human healing and all of that so the 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 layer of bioelectricity i mean that that's energy right? Would you say that that's subtle energy? Would you say, what, well, how would you call it? What would you call it? Is it chi? Um, you know, it's, yeah. it's I, we, we've had, yeah, we've had a bunch of discussions with, with those folks. And I, I you know, I, I, I don't know that uh, I, I don't have any, any evidence to say that the phenomenon they, they're calling chi is specifically what, what we study as bioelectricity. I don't know that those are the same things, but, yeah. um, but I do think they have a couple things, right. And uh, w one of the things that they were right very early about is uh, this notion of multiple intelligences within the body, this idea that yeah. literally not, not metaphorically, not, uh, you know, <laughs> not, not, the, you know, crazy doc, but, but actually literally with a very, with a very specific, um, definition of intelligence as problem solving in various spaces. Uh, the fact that our body is full of sub agents that have agendas that have a, a, a problem solving competencies. Like, so, so they, I, I think they were 100% on the money about that one. And the other thing is this notion of persistent physiological states as, uh, as, as, um, objects. So, you know, they'll tell you, like, if you, if you do, um, yeah, I don't know, either massage therapy or something, they'll say, oh, you've got this blockage that, you know, this thing is sitting here and we're going to try to, we're going to try to move it, or we're going to try to get rid of it or whatever. This, this, this idea that these other spaces like physiological state space and so on, um, th there are persistent patterns in those spaces that are the equivalent of, uh, of, of objects in, in three-dimensional space that are, they have causal, uh, they have causal power, they do things. And uh, they have their own dynamics and they're persistent over some amount of time and, and they can be moved and they can be you know, uh, modified and, 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 you know, and some of them are, are uh, contribute to disease, no doubt um, that, that like, I think, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very promising direction. And we're, we're doing a bunch of, um, we're starting a bunch of work on, uh, on, on, on being able to, to detect them and uh, developing uh, predictive technologies to then uh, manipulate them. So, so that's, yeah, I think that's going to be a part of, of real medicine. Very cool. Good question. Um, are you interested, Michael and, and Kate too? Uh, I, I'm running across this very strange thing um, in which I think von Neumann is wrong in a fundamental and very puzzling way. It would take a few minutes to talk about it, and we've been going for a while. So, we I don't we don't need to bring it up at all or bring it up some other time or just continue where we are. Why don't you call it, Michael? What I, 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 I'd love I'd love to hear about it. Um, I I've got till I've got another uh, nine minutes before I have to hop off. Of it, so we could talk about it. I'm also very happy to um, schedule another one of these so I can hear in more detail. If I mean I'm guessing it's going to take more than nine minutes to talk about it. So um, well, I, I look okay. I can get the puzzle started. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, so von Neumann in 1956, post posthumously, um, published a paper on self-reproducing automata. 
and it's brilliant. So here he comes, and he's he's helped invent the universal Turing machine called the von Neumann architecture, and he wants to make a machine that can copy itself. So here's the logical steps. He's going to make a, this is going to work in the real physical world. It's actually going to build things. It's not going to manipulate bits. So he starts with the universal constructor. So the universal constructor can construct anything, if that makes any sense. So let it go. But then this is very interesting because for the universal constructor to construct anything in particular, you better have some instructions. So he imagines the instructions as some physical system, like a bunch of uh, 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 steel I-beams I I uh, jointed together in some way. For the universal constructor to make anything specific, you, it better have access to these instructions. So you put the instructions or this structure inside the universal constructor. And once you do that, something magical happens. The, the information, the instructions, now play a dual role. They are used to direct the universal constructor to construct something specific, namely a copy of itself. I mean, it could have made a rat. It could have made a, a you know, a choo-choo train, but it made a rabbit. I mean, it, it made a copy of itself. So now there's this copy of the universal constructor sitting over there, but it can't make anything until it has inside of it some instructions on what to make. So von Neumann's move is, okay, the universal constructor constructs a physical copy of the instructions and sticks the physical copy of the instructions in the second new universal constructor. So that's a lot. Okay, that's the basic idea. And it was hailed, isn't that wonderful? That's what DNA does. It template replicates. And it's used as a code for synthesis of proteins. Then the DNA gets replicated by the machinery and stuck in the daughter cell. And that's true. And we've been stuck there. Or we've been... So uh, I could. Uh, it's entirely wrong for at least some self-reproducing molecular systems so I can get us started, Michael. Kate's heard me. A guy named, you know, I've been thinking about autocatalytic sets for over 50 years. Gonan Ashkenazi in the Ben Gurion literally has a nine peptide collectively autocatalytic set. Uh, and so let me define more precisely what a Kantian whole is. It's Kant's idea, not mine. The parts exist for and by means of the whole. So you're a Kantian whole. You exist for by means of your liver and your kidney and your spleen, but they exist by means of you. So all living things are Kantian holes. Um, so Gonan's autocatalytic set of nine peptides is a Kantian hole. Each peptide catalyzes the formation of a second copy of the next peptide, right? Uh, around a cycle of the nine peptides. So each peptide gets to exist by virtue of being a member of the nine peptide set. So the nine peptide sets the Kantian whole, and each peptide is the part. So it's, it's true, it's Kantian whole. Two more notions. Catalytic closure, which I had a long time ago. Catalytic closure is every reaction that a last step in the reaction step making any, any, anything is catalyzed by somebody. So it's collectively autocatalytic. And it is. Then there's this idea of constraint closure, which Kate hinted at. When I was writing investigations, I was wondering, so what's work? And uh, work is the constraint, this is Atkins in the second law, work is the constrained release of energy into a few degrees of freedom. So I finally understood that's a cannon with the powder at the base of the cannon and the cannonball. And the cannon is the constraint on the release of energy and it's a boundary condition. So when the powder explodes, you don't get a spherical wave. You get the, the, the powder only can met, blast goes down the bore of the cannon and it does thermodynamic work on the cannonball. So I understood that. Then I being, you know, we're both, you know, Kate's not a Jew, but we are. I thought, so, you know, where the fuck, where'd the cannon come from? And I realized that it took work to make the cannon. Uh-oh. No constraints on the release of energy, no work. Yes. Yes. But at least in some cases, no work, no constraints on the release of energy. 
And I got stuck there, Michael, except that I realized that the release of energy uh, could construct a new constraint. So I'm going to give you the brilliant idea, it's transformative, that Matteo Mosio and Mahal Mondeville had in 2015. So this is a lot to pack into nine minutes, but here it is. Three minutes. Three minutes. I'll get it across. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I want to get I want to get some constrained release of energy. So I better have some non-equilibrium processes. So uh, these two guys say, let there be three processes: one, two, and three. They're non-equilibrium processes, but there better be some constraints on the release of energy. So let there be three constraints: A, B, and C. So pause and really hear this. A constrains the release of energy in process one, and it makes a B. B constrains the release of energy in process two, and it makes a C. C constrains the release of energy in process three, and it makes an A. So this is an amazing thing, Michael, and it's not mine, so I can really brag about it. This is a new organization of matter in process. There are a set of constraints. The constraints are boundary conditions. The, the three boundary condition constraints constrain the release of energy in three non-equilibrium non processes to construct the same boundary conditions. The system constructs itself. This is the heart of life right here. Uh, we construct our choo-choo trains they don't construct themselves. So Gonanashkanazi set does this, and I'll try to say it quickly. Each peptide binds two fragments that are half copies of the next peptide. By binding them, it orients them in three space, so it lowers the activation energy for the reactions. So there's a constrained release of energy. A peptide bond is formed, and work is done when peptide one makes a second copy of peptide two around the cycle. So this system, Golan's got, is a Kantian hole that achieves constraint closure and catalytic closure. I think that is probably Bergson's Elan uh, Vital, and I think it's life. Now look at what this system does, Michael, and Kate's heard me say it. This system constructs specifically itself. The nine peptides that constructs itself, and so does a cell, specifically constructs itself. It's not a universal constructor. And the amazing thing is um, there is no separate description. There's no instructions in Gonan Ashkenazi's nine peptide set. It's nine peptides, and each peptide is a boundary condition on the release of energy making the next peptide. That's the whole thing. There's nothing more to be said. There's no separate description. There's nothing which is acting as instructions that are getting copied and stuck into a second copy. This is now, we, I'm not getting to DNA, it's just an autocatalytic peptide set. So this system specifically constructs itself because it's the constraints on the release of energy that constructs the same constraints. It's absolutely not von Neumann's universal constructor. And it doesn't change very much when you get DNA into it. So there's something very strange going on of what we mean by information and how it can be that there's something that we call information that von Neumann's talking about. Uh, it's really puzzling. Uh, do you see the distinction? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I absolutely do. And, and even, uh, even, even the, the, the story you contrasted with, with the DNA story is partly this anyway, because DNA is not a description of the organism. DNA no. does, does not have a description of the anatomy. I mean, it's basically... The DNA, yeah, the D, DNA, and an easy way to... Yeah, DNA can be thought of as a code because it's, and it is. It specifies polypeptides. And Paul Paul uh, Paul Davies points out that given the translation apparatus of the code, the DNA is a universal constructor for encodable polypeptides. But, yeah, polypeptides, not, not anatomy. Not a cell. Yeah, yeah. so, you know... If you if you were to take a yeast cell and clone random DNA sequences into all the genes, it'd make a bunch of polypeptides, but the cell would die, right? It's yeah, lethal. that's a that's a, that, that that whole thing. We we should um so uh, we should have another talk about um what 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 level of reprogrammability we see in biology because there's some cool there's some cool examples and it's not about DNA at all but there but there's some interesting examples of 
Uh, let, let, let's do it. Let me, I know we're at the end, but look, let me just give you one other piece that's so puzzling. Um, so we have a notion of what information is. There's a Mondrian painting, and I want to know how much information is in it. I'm asking how many bits does it take to describe the Mondrian painting? So I break it up into centimeter by centimeter squares, and there's 10,000 of them because I did, you know, 100 by 100 or whatever it is. And then I use four bits to say what color is there. So there's four times, there's 40,000 bits is the description of the Mondrian painting. And it's really true that I can send that over a computer to printing machines all around the world that use totally different machines to make different kind, physically different ways of making copies of the Mondrian paintings. So the information really is separable from the goddamn Mondrian painting, and we just did it. That has nothing to do with how Gonan Ashkenazi's peptide said, mm -hmm. there's no separate description. There's something funny about our notion, and I've got a loose hunch that I've sort of said to you too, Kate, it's something about a description from the outside. We are giving a description from the outside of the painting. Von Neumann is giving a description from the outside and sticking that outside description in that is then used in a dual way as a program and then gets copied. That's not how that's not how cells build themselves, Michael. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. And that means there's something finally fucked up about our notions of information. It's the yeah. wrong word, but it was confused. It's really true that we could describe in, you know, 40,000 bits, the Mondrian painting, and we can send it over computer wires around the world and make 10 zillion copies of it. Uh, but we're using those machines all over the world to do it. And there's nothing specific. We could have made a copy of anything. Yeah. Life isn't doing that. It's doing something fundamentally different and I, at this point, I really get confused. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great, uh, that's a great place to take up uh, the next one. Um, that's a yeah. very good point, and there's some stuff. Um, yeah, I, I have to, unfortunately, I have to run, but let's, um, let's set up, uh, let's set up another one and keep going because uh, you're onto, you're, I think you're onto something very key. Well, there's all kinds of stuff.